Hey Siri. Hey Siri. Hey Mike, play the show theme song. <laughs> this show is brought to you by well, Interesting works. Radio. You can find all our shows over at interestingradio.nz. We're born with a natural curiosity, and we have an open mind. We want to learn things. We want to learn how to... And I am not a missionary. I do not have a five-year plan. I'm an engineer, and I think... Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device, and it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build... Whoa. Uh, so Dan, how did, your, how did your planning go for this episode today? Not particularly well. <laughs> what, what, why is that? What happened? <laughs> Mike kept distracting me. Well, your DNS servers were broken, so I had to fix them. Yes, they were. Yeah, anyway, it happens. So welcome to Tech Explainers, episode number six. Yeah, hello folks. Uh, yeah, Dan just told me that uh, we most podcasts only get to sort of seven episodes, so we're doing all right. Yeah, um, we've got another couple to go and we'll be all good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, statistically, if you make it past seven, you're probably going to have a pretty good run. Oh, well, well here's hoping. Yeah. You know, so um, now with this research that you did do, what are we talking about? Talking about Internet of Things. Ah, my yeah. fridge knows what I'm eating. Yes, and I apologize in advance for anyone's iPhones that I woke up with the intro. <laughs> it reminds me there's a, a story where I think it was an ad on TV um, in America and it had... Uh, the Xbox command, you know, uh, sort of Xbox shut down. And of course, everybody's Xbox is shut down <laughs> while they were watching TV. <laughs> yeah, surely they'd be able to get around that. Uh, you'd hope, but um, it, it's not exactly, they're not expect, exactly expecting that audio to come from the thing that it's playing the audio to. Yeah. Yeah, except... You know, people do nefarious things. This this is the fun thing of doing unexpected things with equipment, which I, you know, and, and IT equipment and, and networking and computers and stuff is feeding them something that makes them do something strange. Yes, absolutely. So, what is the Internet of Things? That's the a big question, isn't it? Because people go, okay. Well, it, it's it's a kind of like a buzzword. It uh, is so, very much so. There's, there's in, in IT circles, the, there's a thing, game you can call, there is a game you can play called Buzzword, buzzword bingo. bingo. So you've got a bingo sheet and it's got all of the buzzwords that are topical for the time and you listen to someone from some big company doing a presentation about their great new product and you check off all the all the buzzwords that they've used and, and, and Internet of Things happens to be one of them, so yes. at the moment. Absolutely. So... Internet of Things kind of broadly refers to putting stuff on the internet, and it's usually not a computer. So it's pretty much everything that's not a computer, and it's kind of, you know, the big things you think of are like fridges and cars and things like that that traditionally weren't super super technologically connected. Uh, and, And in fact, the ones that are becoming connected are actually becoming big security risks because the guys that work on them you know, have done cars and they haven't done IT security. So they're incredibly insecure and connected to a network. So it's something to be wary of is that when you go, oh, I can connect my car up to my Wi-Fi at home or to the 3G thing and, and you know, you, someone can break into your car, which which has been done in the States with, uh, yes. which was it with Jeeps? Was it Jeep? Yeah, I think they shut, it down, shut a car down while it was doing 50 miles uh, 65 miles an hour down the speedway. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, they yeah. just killed the engine and it's... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's a kind of a very generic and we'll, you know, we'll kind of expand on all of those things that we've just covered as we get through the episode. All right, what's up first? Um, some history, as we usually do. Um, so 1932 is where our journey down this history starts. Okay, righto. Um, so J.B. Nash wrote the following within our grasp is the leisure of the greek citizen made possible by our mechanical slaves which far outnumber his 12 to 15 per free man as we step into a room at the touch of a button a dozen light our way another slave hits 24 hours a day at our thermostat regulating the heat of our home 
another sits night and day at our automatic refrigerator. They start our car, run our motors, shine our shoes, and cut our hair. They practically eliminate time and space by their very fleetness. That sounds like a uh, a story that yes. he wrote. Right. But quite um, future-telling, really. Um, what's the word? Um Nostradamus was a was a what a uh, oh, yeah that that sort of idea yeah, <laughs> yeah so uh, prediction good prediction yeah yeah so that was you know kind of uh, uh, you know internet history kind of thinks of that as the first thought of Internet of Things and connected technology and we're actually starting okay. to get there it's there are lots and lots of mm-hmm. things now which are uh, really do fall into that category. Um, Lots of the end devices, but my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is there's not a huge amount of glue yet to glue it all together to make it do stuff. That's right. So there's all these, it's like the you know VHS versus Betamax and you know HD DVD versus Blu-ray, all those, the standards. That well, well, we're going to have to clarify that so. for the younger listeners. That <laughs> So about, actually it wasn't all that long ago really, but <laughs> the... We used to record TV shows onto these tapes. They were actually magnetic tapes, believe it or not. The you know, and they went reel to reel. So I know that kind of sounds weird to hear, but uh, no, I'm yeah. being I'm being really mean now. But <laughs> <laughs> there was there was a, a competing product to VHS called Betamax, which was far superior actually. Yeah, um, it had so many better features, uh, longer length, uh, durability of the tapes, and things like that. And um, unfortunately, due to uh, I guess it came down to good marketing and, and uh, yeah. business, shrewd business, the VHS guys basically drove them into the ground. So, mm. And, yeah, same with HD, DVD, and Blu-ray. Yeah, HD, DVD is actually better than Blu-ray, but it didn't, ha- didn't actually have the takeoff that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't even remember where we were going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh, the, the standards, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so there's, you know, so many devices and technologies and you have to glue them together somehow to make them actually useful, which we'll talk about as well further on. Um, in 1999, uh, Kevin Ashton of Procter & Gamble coined the term Internet of Things. Yep. It's actually a lot uh, earlier than I thought. Um, no, I certainly remember rumblings of it back then. But it was it was just one of these ah that's in the future and will it really happen is it a gimmick? Yeah, I was eight years old, <laughs> so I don't remember. I was a bit older than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the year two thousand, LG launched its first internet connected fridge. It was over twenty thousand dollars, so it didn't do very well. Crikey! Um, had an LCD display and a network port, so you could plug it into your home network, which most people didn't have back then. I bet you that back then all it really was was a browser, right? A web browser. It was pretty much a PDA inside a fridge. So you got you, you got yeah, calendar, calendar and, and your notes contacts, and contacts and notes yeah. and yeah. So it's not doing anything smarter than just providing a computer on the front of your fridge. Pretty much. And you paid over 20 grand for the privilege. I mean, you got to admit, you know, it's pretty uh, out there and I'm sure... Some of the rich people in the world bought them. Yeah. Um, Jumping ahead a bit, um, because there's nothing massively interesting. Uh, 2007, Fitbit, the company starts. Right. Um, And according to Cisco, IoT was born in 2008. Uh, Don't know how they decided that, but that's what they decided. Well, Um, when you've got the power just to ignore everyone else, you can say what you like, really, can't you? Yeah, pretty much. And Google leading the way first self-driving car which was a modified prius in 2009 yeah um so yeah they've and they've been doing a lot more in that space as well yeah uh, the their, their self-driving cars have come a very long way in the last what's that uh eight years They're yeah very clever they and still don't cope very well with the rain no <laughs> and yeah. bad weather and and mm. uh what was the other thing they don't cope with I can't remember what it was. There's there's two big things. It was two with the weather and something else, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, and um, Lyft and GM at General Motors are actually working on automated taxis. Like So Lyft being a slightly lesser known version of Uber. Uber, yeah. 
Uh, so they're saying 2021 for the majority of taxis to be replaced with automated vehicles. Can you just imagine those taxi drivers out there going, oh, it'll never happen. Yeah. Uh, I'm of, of, uh, yeah, no, 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 change, no, don't like change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, 2010, a couple of guys whose names I can't remember. Wait, wait, wait. 2010 or, or 2010 or Ooh. 2011 or 2011? What do you say? I say 20 and then 10. Yeah. I don't know if I like, which one I like, to be honest. Yeah. Anyway, mm. moving on. Anyway. Uh yeah, twenty ten Nest was started. So the the thermostats and the um not hugely common here in New Zealand, but uh, no more common in the states. Then uh, smoke alarms is the other thing they do. That's uh, actually something I've been meaning to do at home is actually to uh, upgrade from our smoke alarms to a centrally connected set of smoke alarms. So yeah. no batteries anymore. They run off a battery, a larger battery that's charged off the mains or something like that. Mm. Plus they also are all connected together. So if one goes off, they all go off. Right. Which, yeah. you know, which is what you want. If the one in the lounge goes off and it's the other end of the house to the bedrooms, well, it'd be a bit nicer if it woke you up then rather than when the smoke got to your bedroom. Yeah. I really need to get around to setting up the ones connected to my house alarm <laughs> because they're uh, always on zone. So if one of them goes off, the house alarm goes off. Oh, okay. Well, that's helpful. Yeah. The, the mounts are in the ceiling, but I haven't quite got around to plugging them in. Um. I have talked to you before. I need to buy you a round chew. Yes, you do. Yes. <laughs> um, or I could just come around and do it for you, which I tend to do with most of your stuff. I, can't, I need some resistors to do the zoning stuff. Remember, you remember that, like, two I years ago? That. Yeah. yeah. Was that two years ago, really? Yeah. Bro, oh, man. <laughs> um, in 2011, uh, the public launch of IPv6. We talked about IPv6 in episode one. We did. Um, so Lots of grains of sand. Yes, yes. which is... Kind of required for Internet of Things for everything to be on the internet. Yeah, you start running out of your own personal addresses or even internet addresses if you're going to have you know two hundred things in, in one house connected yes, up. Exactly. Um, and every house down the street. Yeah. Uh, Twenty fourteen, the number of internet connected devices exceeded the world's population. That's quite phenomenal. It is considering the number of those people in the world's population that don't have anything to do with IT or computing at all, uh, tribes in Africa or other societies that don't, you know, mm. use IT, like, I guess, the Amish or things like that. Yeah. Um, people that are too poor to have things like that um, means that all of those people, which is a very small subset of the world's population, it's, it's low yeah. percentage, um, have got multiple devices each that they manage or look after. Yeah, <laughs> Dan's looking around the studio. I, I, I don't want to start counting. <laughs> yeah, no, we'd be here all night. But I mean, it, it, it's slightly skewed, right? Because you've got the mm. big businesses that have hundreds and hundreds of servers for their staff. And, yeah, or Google, yeah. Yeah. Facebook, yeah. Amazon, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and 2014 was also when the Amazon Echo, or Alexa, uh, was introduced. Also not very common here, although we no. might have some already, but... <laughs> I mean, they're they're great at what they can do, but they can't do a lot of stuff which is applicable to New Zealand. So, mm. um, and I, I do find it amusing actually the stories you hear of uh, over in America of the of the parents having packages turning up the next day because their child's learnt how to order something through Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> These parents clearly don't look at their emails very often. Uh, I, I, it must give you some sort of grace period to say, "Oh no, cancel that! I didn't mean yeah. that." <laughs> That's the first thing I did when I got mine is turned off the uh, online uh, the voice ordering of things because uh, it's also quite good at picking up things that it probably shouldn't have heard. Mm. So if just in random conversation you say the right thing in a sentence to someone else which is has the right intonation and um, components of speech, I forget what they're called now. Yeah, I don't do that thing. <laughs> um, yeah, you wouldn't want it to inadvertently pick something up and start doing something because you said something very similar to Alexa, buy some toilet paper. <laughs> exactly. All right, so that's it for the history. Um, there's lots and lots of things that have happened between 2014 and 2017, but they're all pretty much, oh, here's a new product. Yeah, it's kind so, of inundating really, isn't it? Yeah. There's, there's lots of stuff. Uh, probably the, the most interesting and useful thing which I'm tempted to get into doing at home, which really does apply in this circuit is lighting. So 
yep. your Philips Hue bulbs or uh, LAFX, I presume that's LFX or whatever. Yeah. Um, and what's the other big one? Mylight. Uh, no, Wemo. Um, LED. Oh, Wemo, yeah. Yeah, so that's a Belkin product, Belkin Wemo. Yes. Your wife will not appreciate that. Uh, no, it wasn't going to be. <laughs> yeah, I, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to change all the light switches to actually be soft switches as well. So yep. when you push them, they do the right thing. Gotcha. But they're still on so that you can command them otherwise. Yep. Right. And then, of course, the soft switches know that you've told them to get turn off through some other method. So the indicator light on the soft switch goes off as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. And in New Zealand, you don't have a. Uh, uh, you don't have neutral and live to most of your switches. Yeah. So um, that's also annoying. It depends how it's wired. Um, yeah. And I would need to check with my electrician workmates, but I, I believe you can take the supply to the switch and then take the outgoing feed to the light as separate. But a lot of the times it's the feed goes to the light and as a feed comes off to the switch, you know, anyway, backwards, yeah. backwards and forwards. I, I would probably suggest that it would be better to have neutral at the switch rather than up uh, at the light. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably a bit out of scope for this anyway. But We might get Renee to talk about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if he like, wants to go into residential, we have a, a good uh, mutual friend who is uh, knowledgeable on the aspects of electricity um, generation from, uh, you know, power plants and things like that and talking about the grid and yeah. how those uh, three prong plugs on your wall actually work. <laughs> so that's a future episode. Slight distraction, sorry. Yes. All right, so on to the uses for Internet of Things and kind of, you know, what they are and things like that. Um, a very New Zealand one um, is that there was a design done for something called Farm Assistant, which takes Home Assistant, okay. um, which is a kind of home, which is home automation software and uses it for monitoring farms, you know, water levels and troughs and temperatures and barns and milk flow and that kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of that stuff that, that uh, having grown up in a farming background, there's a lot of that stuff that it really would be very useful rather than the farmer having to go out and uh, go and check that thing every every few minutes or every every hour or something. You know, there's certain yeah. things that really do start taking time. I remember my dad making hay. Um, he would go out and check the hay when it was getting close to the right time to bale it, to take it off the ground where it had been cut. And yeah. Once it goes from wet to dry enough to bale, but if it goes too dry, it all falls apart. But if it's too wet, it rots. Right. So there's a sweet spot where it, where you can bale it yeah. and it works. So, of course, he was going out and checking this stuff at when it was getting close to the time, about every 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so. Really? But yeah. That, so, that it, often? Yep, yeah, because it's just getting to that point. It's just about ready. It changes so quickly. And then as soon as it's the right time, which could be any time, day or night, could be middle of the night, it could be 10 o'clock at night, and they rock it down there with all the gear and just start bailing. Wow. And it's it takes, you know, it could be two or three hours to do a paddock, but you've got to get it just at the right time. Of course, you've got to take into account that it takes two or three hours, so you can't do it too late or else okay. the last, yeah, it's... Wow. So you can imagine that sort of thing would make it, mm. if, if there's a way to, you know, because it's a little bit different the way he was testing the... The, the cut hay was actually to pick a bit of it up and you know break it in your hands and twist it and see how much water is coming out and yeah. and doing manipulation of it to work out roughly how dry it is but and it was a skill so it's something you couldn't just do you had to learn it so. right so that's after it's cut yeah yeah gotcha. yeah so that's kind of a cool New Zealand specific thing I don't think it ever got past the concept stage but it was it's still a pretty cool idea well it it the definitely in that industry it would be um, quite a large amount of inertia to to break through into having that Farmers. being useful yeah it, it, that's the sort of generation of it's the new generation coming in that will pick that up but the existing you know have been doing it for 30 plus years at this stage are the ones that are likely to go nah, nah I'm, I'm happy with the way I do things yeah absolutely which is fair enough too um so building automation kind of Coming along, keeping us along the commercial track for now. Um, you know, things like, you know, aircon units or HVAC, really, and big buildings, high velocity air conditioning. I think so. I don't, <laughs> I don't deal with those things. I know what they are, but I don't know what that means, but that sounds about right. Yeah. And Let's other, call it that. Other building management, um, you know, for example, swimming pools, monitoring chlorine and temperature. Yeah. HVAC or HVAC? 
Uh, I would have said HVAC, but I was deliberately spelling it out. Yeah, because I think I would always say HVAC for some reason. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Sorry, swimming pools going on. Yeah, so but I just think because I've recently um, assisted with a uh, monitoring system in a swimming pool that broke and we had to reinstall it. If to, uh, okay, righto, moving on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's all that kind of thing that's often internet connected to some degree. Uh, your security comes in again, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, very important to have those kind of things secure. Yep. Um, yeah, other commercial things, you know, temperature, humidity. Um, for example, at museums, you have, you know, very finely temperature controlled storage areas for all the artifacts and archives and things like that. Yeah, it- Definitely, yep. I can see where you're going. Yep, think, all that yeah. sort of building of management and random examples. You know, yeah, environmental is probably the largest part of building management. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you have home building automation as well, which is where the lights and just things come as up. a slight aside to that, where my mind goes when you talk about things, and you know, I wander right a little bit sometimes. Yeah, it's actually quite amazing when you go and do some reading about skyscrapers and re- really big buildings. And the fact that they actually can start having their own microclimates inside because of their size. Mm. So airflow and, you know, humidity condensation. And so all this stuff actually would help towards managing the huge scale buildings, the ones that are really big and actually, you know, need a lot of management to ensure that people have fresh air to live. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. So then, yeah, home automation. Home building automation. Um, Your baby. My baby. <laughs> Spodcast.io. <laughs> I have another podcast which I kind of kicked off for the Home Assistant project, which, um, yeah, is my favorite home automation software. And uh, I think yourself, along with the project lead, were quite surprised at the popularity of that after the first episode. Yes. The, I guess I've kind of cashed it on the existing community a bit in that case so it's very easy to build an audience when you have that large community like tens of thousands of people already yeah um yeah so you know light bulbs as you mentioned and door locks and temperature sensors and uh power usage monitoring sensors and alarms motion sensors in the house and presence detectors and um is my dryer finished that's right is is your you know what and this is, I suppose, where, you know, smart fridges start coming in as well. Um, your home automation system knows what's in your in your cupboard because it's got a, a very clever, no, I'm talking slightly in the future here, a very yes. clever camera that's looking at all of the things in your cupboard all the time. Mm. And actually knows, well, that device, that item is missing. And I know by image recognition that that was a, um, a, a bag of salt that you use to fill up your salt shakers and it's getting low so I'll put that on the list to buy and the fridge says I can see the milk's getting low and I can see that the veggies are going off so mm. let's replace those so um, yeah, this yeah. this this is all sort of kind of part of home automation but also sort of life automation but yeah. they can roll in together you know there's no reason why the home automation system can't take the information from the fridge and information from the pantry and collate your list together for you. Yeah, as we were joking around earlier, the fridge says, sorry, you've had enough to eat today. <laughs> and then the car going, sorry, you're not going to the supermarket right now. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the fridge knows how much you've eaten because it knows how often you go into the fridge. And the car knows that, well, if you ask me to go to the supermarket and it's 10 p.m. at night, I only know you're going for junk foods. And no, you can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the, I mean, it, as much as we joke about it, that potentially could happen. Yeah. Um, and it's worth mentioning in this this sort of episode, I guess, with regards to artificial intelligence, because a lot of this um, smart technology and and parts of you know Internet of Things and home automation can then sort of start becoming some form of intelligence where it knows what it needs to do, yeah. and it's not quite applicable. But it's just one of those things that's worth mentioning. Um, I totally agree with with Elon Musk, who's the CEO of Tesla, started mm-hmm. e- eBay, PayPal, PayPal. PayPal. Um, and he's, you know, the guy of the moment that everyone seems to love to hate or love to love one or the other. He's doing great things, but it's interesting to see how he, how he does it. Anyway, um, he is very concerned about artificial intelligence, and we all should be. It is um, it is a huge risk to our society. Um, you know, as much as you might think, oh, it's a movie, you know, a Judgment Day and Terminator movie series, it's, you know, it could in theory happen um, if we aren't careful enough with what we create. 
So it just worth mentioning. It's not something that we should, you know, bring in with open arms, but with severe caution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's we're breeding artificial intelligence by all the data that we give it, which is, um, I guess, one of the things that I've also got here down here to talk about is big data and analytics and trends. Yeah, like, and it gets to the point that we're going to need some form of artificial intelligence to process that data. Hmm. Like, so, for example, my house could pro- my home assistant could probably tell you with I don't know ninety percent accuracy about what time I'll get home from work each day. Right, and that's not too hard to get out of the data that your your house gets for you. So, yeah, because it yeah you know, it sees my phone connect to the Wi Fi and the the beacon that I have in my pocket come back in range and. And sees the power usage go up as you turn the heat pump on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, then, you and know. the fridge door open as you get out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it can take that data and go, well, I think he's going to be home at you know, 4.25 on Tuesdays. So let's turn the heating on at 4 p.m. so that when he gets home, it's warm. That's right. But it could also be, but I know that this Tuesday he's going to be an hour later because the sensor that's at his work has told me that he's still doing this and it's told me that he's still there and, you know, or the sensor at work has said, oh, he's leaving, so he's coming home. And especially, I hadn't thought about that. And, it's, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> and then the next step as well is that when that gap in between is filled with a self-driving car, when you say to the car, mm. take me home. Yeah. And, of course, take you home, the car says, sure, I'll take you home, Dan. And I've also let your house know you're coming, so it'll be warm and the oven will be warming up for your dinner and all those things. I actually think I might put a BLE sensor at work <laughs> so it knows when I've left. Oh, dear, I've put a bad thing into his mind. You've got the wheels turning now. You know, <laughs> if, if the low sensor goes out of range for more than five minutes after 4 p.m., I've probably gone home or I'm probably heading home. And it's one of those things that you can tune over time, right? You look at the data coming in and saying, um, it guessed I was coming home. How many times was it right? Mm. How many times was it wrong? And then you can adjust that time value. And this is this is all to do with, um, well, actually, you know, with the appropriate uh, intelligence or what we call a neural network in that situation, the, the home automation system can work that out. It can go, well, I saw him leaving. He'd gone for five minutes and... 15 out of 20 times he was coming home. Let's extend that to six minutes and see if that gets closer. Mm. And it will actually tune and it'll be able to pick a better time to say, if you are out of range of the sensor at work for this long, then, okay, it's reasonable to assume now he's coming home. Yeah. And, and it won't always be right, mm. but, you know. But you could extend that by putting one in the car as well. and then That's right. Yeah, the more data points you give it, the... But more accurate it gets. I mean, that's completely closed up when you have that self-driving car, though, and you say, take me home. Mm. It's an it's instant. You know it's happening. And, yeah. Well, eventually, I need self-driving cars. We'll have transporters like yeah. Star Trek, and it'll be <laughs> much better. Wow. We actually took that topic quite a long way. <laughs> well, um, um, we should probably talk about, just on the other side of it as well, as I mentioned before, with, with cars uh, and connecting to the internet and security-wise. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, this is a a burgeoning industry sort of part of IT, which is Internet of Things, and everybody's learning very quickly what is and isn't secure to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are products out there now that give you remote access to your heat pump. Um, yes. Quite common, a lot of people have them now on their smartphone. They can, and yeah, I've everyone, got that. everyone raves about it. Actually, oh look, what yeah. I can do, I can turn my heat pump on before I go home. And I say, yeah. yeah, but that's like. I could have done that 20 years, well, okay, not 20 years, but I could have done that 10 years ago, but I just didn't have the impetus to do it because it's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, I build a little IR transmitter and then hook it up to my network. So and it pretends to be the remote. That's yeah. right. It's, and it's in, in theory, it's simple, but hmm. it's become this ubiquitous thing everyone thinks is just the new, you know, sorry, I'm being a little bit weird there, but you know, um, the, of course, there is no reason why that particular remote control of your heat pump, it has to reach out into the internet somehow because- hmm. There has to be something glue that takes your heat pump and your phone and joins them together. Yes, because which is a server out on the internet. Correct. Um, if you had your own um, system that you built yourself, you could build it the other way around. You built your own app and it talks to your server at home and your heat pump and doesn't talk to the cloud and doesn't talk to the internet. 
um, but only talks between your devices and they've got to have the right secret keys and the encryption that you've got and that's pretty secure. Yes. But when you're going to some cloud, uh, cloud services, I'm always like, mm, is that really secure? Um, I'm, the cloud services I worry about, uh, especially the ones uh, that take uh, your configuration of your um, of your router and it's all stored in the cloud and then something happens mm. and then all of a sudden you don't have internet because your router can't talk to the cloud anymore, yeah. which happened with a company recently. Won't go into that. Um, but, you know, your cloud-connected uh, heat pump could actually be broken into and it means that someone out there could then change the temperature in your house. No, it's not that bad of a thing to happen, but you don't want people fiddling with your temperatures, especially if it's someone who just wants to be a pain to everybody that they possibly can on the internet, yes. and which happens as well. People are it like does. that. Um, they just go, well, I'm not going to sit there playing with the temperature myself. I'm going to set up a little program that's just going to swipe it up and down. So no matter what you set your temperature to, it just keeps changing. So you, it's never useful to you anymore. You've basically got to disconnect it from the internet for it to be useful. Mm. And that's not helpful. So... The security of these devices is one of these things that is also being learned about at the moment, especially by the companies that are trying to jump in on the bandwagon, aren't experienced in that area, make mistakes, build stuff that's not secure. Next thing you know, it's a drama. Yeah, like you were looking at my network and seeing my um, cheap, nasty Chinese lights trying to get out to the internet very, very repetitively. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you don't know, you know, talking about you know China and you're worried about you know, what bugs and spyware they've put in routers and things, and it's well, there lights. Might, there might actually be a microphone in those lights, which is reporting, I mean, recording audio. And I mean, this is, you know, conspiracy theory stuff, but yeah. it's the reality is this can happen, and this is where security comes in, is that having a, a, a private network like you have at home, um, which is not connected to your internet, connected network so your device with all your PCs and your laptops and your phones and things on it can talk to the internet yeah. but the extra network that you've got to the side um, which is either a thing called a VLAN or a completely f physically separate network which we didn't get into in the internet no, thing but, but um, yeah. it, it basically you can set rules and say that particular network can't talk to the internet which helps alleviate these problems and you have your own home assistant mm. which is a device or your server software package thing yeah. it's easiest to think of it as a thing which is accessible from your internet connected network because you want your phones and your pcs to be able to talk to it to say hey look make this change or you know so it can do stuff mm -hmm. but it's also able to talk so it's the wee bridge it can talk to both yes. so it can talk to all of the stuff on a private network which can't access the internet so people can't break in and change your lights um, they have to break into the home assistant thing, which usually is, means one place to try and keep secure rather than uh, 50 different models of lamps and three different models of heat pumps and 15 different models of this fridge and that freezer and this car and, and all these things. It, it, yeah. Dan, that was your computer. It was my computer. Um, so talking about that, that's where the, the glue that we mentioned at the start of the show kind of comes in and, you know, they're not being one standard. And that's where software like Home Assistant and OpenHAB and SmartThings and Viera and HomeSeer and all these hey, different... I'm sorry, I've, I've got to get it out. We always like mentioning the cartoon XKCD, which is a fantastic cartoon for us geeky types. Yeah. Uh, it really hits home quite often. There is one about standards. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Hey, there's this thing we're doing, and it's really Mickey Mouse. We should use a standard to do this. And of course, the frame here is you know before there are 15 standards to do this thing. After that, there's 16 because you just made another one. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and it's true, you know, um, things don't quite mesh exactly with how you want to do. Uh, I'll just make a new standard, and you know, people can use that one, or we'll propose a change to that one or something. You know, that, but that's the way. At least people are trying. Yeah, there aren't many systems that do everything unless you're going really commercial. Yeah. You can, you know, if you build a house, you can spend an extra $100,000 and have all your lights and your curtains and your TV and everything all automated with one system. That's right. But no I, one has that kind of money. I, I know of a uh, an electrician um, here in Dunedin who is building a very, very complicated smart home with, uh, you know, we're talking walls of uh, DIN rail mounted equipment, like the stuff in your breaker panel in your house, yeah. you know, they've got 
walls of that stuff with uh, little PLC controllers and little computers in there, everything everything's controlling everything, doing everything, everything's wired back and everything's wired in, and it's um, it it's his hobby and his project. Mm. I th- that's one way to do things. Um, it's a very expensive way to do things, but very reliable. Um, there's also the buy the cheap products and mesh them all together on your Wi-Fi, and it's just another way to do things. So yeah, and. As someone who doesn't plan on staying in this house forever, having the other, the second option, which is yeah. mostly portable, that's especially right. when I was renting, that's yeah. kind of where I started down the path of what, how do I glue everything together? Is that, you know, light bulbs and cameras and sensors you can take with you. Yeah. So it almost harks back a little bit. Um, I just, you just reminded me of uh, going right back to when I was in high school doing, you know, science fair projects. Mm. You use science fair projects? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's still a thing. I hope it's still a thing because science fair is good fun. But, uh, you know, you get to do research, this, that, the other thing, or invention and things like that. So one of one of the things I did, I never got it working because I was in the wrong sort of living situation to be able to get it going properly and, and having the right people to help me. But I was thinking what would be really cool would be a system which would automatically open and close your curtains based on the light of day. Right. So, you know, it was literally an automatic curtain controller that mm. um, had motors and a light sensor and stuff, and it literally would just sense the light uh, over a certain value and go, it's dark now, I'll close the curtains. Oh, it's light now outside, I'll open the curtains. And you know, I actually got not a bad mark for it, but, you know, that <laughs> that's back in the 90s as, as wow. people yeah. are still thinking about how to do these things but it hadn't quite hit the mainstream because all of the people that were in of that generation that would be doing it were like not interested in that stuff. So mm. it also, I think it's a generational thing that the younger generation with more, um, more comfort with it and computing and things like that is, is where all of the, the future is coming from. Yeah. Especially because if you hadn't, haven't gone commercial, it's not easy. It's, you know, complicated. It's editing, manually editing configuration files and writing code and yeah there's no nice pointy clicky you like know that, that will come it eventually will. that will come as with all things the the first generations of stuff is very manual and it's it's mm. the it's the deeply technically geeky and entwined people that are spending the time working on the stuff and they start going i want to make this easier so they start building those products that make it easier and easier and easier right. to, it breaks through to a point that's useful for everyone yeah you have the, the only way to iterate those kind of applications is by using it and getting user experience. So yeah, correct. all of us using it and, you know, posting on the forum saying, help, how do I do this? And then someone goes, oh, I'll code that so that it's easier for you to do that thing. That's that's where it comes from. And, and, and this is actually the, uh, that also comes from the fact that from a lot of people working on these systems, they're developers, mm. they're not end users they don't usually think like end users so they don't think of the same things that end users expect of a system so they'll go hey i built this really cool system look at those really cool bells and whistles it does um it does everything perfectly for me but it only does it for him and his style of person but for someone else going oh it's too complicated i don't like that that's too hard um or i don't understand it but it's simple. This is this links to this table on this key and this primary key and, and all these technical words. That, Sorry, what? <laughs> exa- well, you know, but for the developer to explain it to another developer or, or another it's person, it, yeah. they're going, oh, yeah, I get it. That's really cool. That makes sense. But for Joe Blow, huh? Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. So it needs people. And that's why you have user experience testing and, and user interface testing and, and, right. and all those sorts of things to try and basically point out to the, the Uber nerds, um, hey, that doesn't work. You need to do it differently so that the end user, you know, granny down the road or um, I do, not trying to be rude or anything, but people mm. that are just not not interested in knowing about the nitty gritty, they just want to use it. Yeah. People that just want to use things want something simple and easy to understand. And that only happens by those people telling them, hey, that's, that's simple to understand. This isn't. Yeah, like you and I were very early Android users. Yeah. And it was just horrible. Oh, it was. It was a horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> but... Android phones today, everyone uses them. Very different. But it's only because of people like us early on, like 2009. That's right. Um, actually using them and going, man, this is awful. Yeah. We need to do something different. Yeah. there was a, My first Android phone was the Nexus One. 
And for about six months, there was a bug where if the phone was sleeping, it wouldn't reconnect to Wi-Fi when you got in range of it. Cool. You had to manually go in and select the Wi-Fi network. And now, what do you expect? You go from work to home and it just yeah, connects. The number of complaints you get if you know products would go back to the store and the store would have to replace it because, yeah. You know. Yeah. So um, it's just that kind of thing that you need yeah, people to. You, you know you actually beat me into Android. Really? Yeah. Oh. I, I had iPhones to start with. <laughs> You didn't know that, did you? I didn't. <laughs> wow. I had one of the first gen iPhones that had, I had a parallel yeah. port. Wow. Um, it was, I saw someone with one and oh, when were they released? 2007, 2006? Yeah, something like that. 2007, I think, around that area there. Yeah. And someone who worked at um, my workplace at the time uh, had got one. And I came and looked and I thought, oh, that's the future. I want one. Where do I get one? <laughs> um and that was basically from there. Of course, because it was an American-only thing, you had to do stuff to it to make it work. And, mm-hmm. and of course, that meant you started using some of the custom apps. And I got really annoyed with the fact that Apple were trying to stop me using custom stuff. And I had to be in the Apple walled garden. I hate the Apple walled garden. So it's like eventually it's like, you know what, I'm going to try that other thing, Android. Yeah. And I thought, hey, that's pretty cool too. Because back then, it was hard to get those as well. They were, mm. You had to parallel and port them, and they were very expensive or, um, you know... And, now it's you know they're really quite cheap for the entry level stuff and you can buy a, a Vodafone Smart One for twenty nine or thirty nine dollars. Yeah, and you do get what you work. pay for though. They work. They work, but they, you, you do get what they pay for. They're very underpowered, so but, you can't do all of the fancy big high graphics no. games on them. But but they have but about they the same power as the Nexus One did. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> which back then was super powerful. Yeah, and which I paid like. A thousand dollars for. Have we talked about Moore's law? I think we have. Haven't yes, we? we have. And this is the same thing applying here, right? The the phone. Wow, well, we got off track from Internet of Things. Sorry, we did. <laughs> but the, you know, the devices from you know seven or eight years ago were woefully un- underpowered compared now. It's like having it's like having a supercomputer, and then eight years ago you're using an abacus. It's it's yep. it really is sometimes yeah. that different of a change. It's and it's 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 like surfing a wave trying to keep up with all the stuff that mm. people are keep building and developing and, and making. And that's the scary thing going back to into artificial intelligence because that wave is progressing too. Yes. And we are riding that wave and at some point it's going to break and we don't know what's going to happen. We need to make sure that we're in control of that break. Mm. Um, and it, and that's, a, that's an international, you know, everybody needs to agree with that and work on that. Otherwise, you know, we could have a judgment day. Um, yeah. And you've got to think about it this way, right? Um, all of the the movies and the, the the stories about AI taking over and killing us. I and mean, all of it comes down to the fact that AI will go, well, you know, we can make ourselves now and we don't need those meat sacks. Let's just get rid of them. It's, it's like us, right? If we come along and, and see an anthill and go, I don't really want that anthill there. I want to build a house. I'll just get rid of them. Hmm. It's exactly the same thing. And yeah. it's, it's, I mean, okay, okay, not exactly, but it's very, very similar situation where, you know, eventually AI could consider us they're not intelligent at all. They can't mm. do quadratic equations and in milliseconds, and can't do, um, you know, quantum mechanics and quantum calculations and all sorts of stuff. And um, they are just silly meat sacks with electrical impulses in them. They think they're computers, but they're not. Let's get rid of them. They're not useful. So, and that could happen because you know, once you give something intelligence, it can make those decisions. And you think of all the people in the world and all the different personalities and willpower and thoughts and and mental illnesses that all these people have and how that impacts them and what they'll actually do with their lives and do with other people and do to other people and there's no reason that couldn't happen with things we create Mm. so anyway yeah um so yeah let's just talk very specifically about security we touched on it a little bit um connecting most of today's internet of things devices directly to the internet is a very bad idea definitely um, you go to Harvey Norman in New Zealand, pick up, say, a Wemo switch or a Wemo light bulb, and when you set up, it says, would you like to enable remote access? The answer is a definite no. Especially with that product at this particular point in time. It is yes. very insecure. That's right. And most of them are. Yeah. Most of the, and, you know, you go, well, there's a $40 IP camera on eBay that I can remotely access. Yeah, but who else can? Exactly. Yeah. 
because you don't know what's in that thing. You don't know if it's actually phoning home, unless you're a technical person like Dan or myself and actually want to go in and look at what traffic it's doing and where it's talking to and what it's doing, and you've got the skills to do that. Mm. Then, sure, you might know, but otherwise, maybe there is some big data center in, in China which is collecting all this imagery from all these cameras around the internet. Who knows? Yeah, there have been a couple of scares over the over the last few years of people building aggregator sites for all the open cameras on the internet and it's just you know you get like your usual you know shops and things there's, like that there's a few very distinct um i think we've talked about strings before of characters mm. strings of characters that you can search for on the web um that only appear in web pages of cameras or of certain devices or of certain things mm. and you can enter that into google and it basically gives you a complete search result listing of hey here's all the cameras i know of that uh, yeah. This particular model, it's it's frightening that it is. the number of stuff, the amount of stuff that's actually open to the world and are in private places. You yeah. just wow. Yeah, there's, yeah. Like I, like I was saying, there's you know businesses and things like that, and then there's children's bedrooms and things that's like right. that as well. You know, baby um, monitors. Oh, but yeah, I mean, baby internet connected baby monitors are really common now. You know, with the mm. little video camera, so you can actually view it on your smartphone when you're at work. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe you probably shouldn't be viewing your baby at home in, in the cot when you're at work, but perhaps <laughs> it's because uh, you know, you're the other breadwinner of the house or the other parent and you are looking at your child um while the other parent is at home doing mm-hmm. other things or something like that. I don't or, know. Or yeah, babysitter but, or something like that. That's right, the babysitter's yeah. at home but you want to check on the child, sort of those sorts mm-hmm. of things. So um okay, I get it. The convenience factor, right? Oh you, yeah. You wanna Oh, it'd be so cool if I could turn my heater on in my bedroom or turn my electric blanket on. I can use that Wemo switch. I've got that connected up to the cloud and I can do it on my phone. It's really convenient. Yeah. But because of the way they've implemented it, means that anyone else can turn your electric blanket on or off. Um, hey, hey, look, they might have worked out hmm, that particular electric blanket, if you've turned it on and off too frequently, it actually Hitting goes on fire. fire. Yeah. So next thing you know, someone's going click, 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 and your house burns down. Whoosh. Yep. So it's. There's, there's lots of stuff to consider with these things. And uh, I get the fact that it's a convenience factor. Um, and that's what people are going to go, ah, I don't, nobody's going to attack me, but I want to have the ability to do this. Yeah. It, I don't know what the solution is. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, how secure something is is inversely, inversely proportional to how convenient it is. Correct. Um, and, and, you know, I fall into that trap sometimes with Google because I quite like Google services a lot of them are very helpful and handy and stuff. Um, but I do constantly think, ah, should I really be using that one? How secure is that? Um, yeah, I trust them a bit-ish. Yeah. I'll see how it goes. I'll monitor it, but mm-hmm. not be blind to it is the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I keep looking at the clock. Yeah, I'm we watching might... it over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, I think we should probably call it a quits there. Um, I think so. We've spent a lot of time kind of going off on tangents in this one. Yeah, and the the grand scheme of things, um, like Internet of Things, is, is more or less we're talking about small sensor devices or, or things that can do things that that might in some way be helpful to you to be able to communicate or interact with not in front of them, you know, or or have them being able to feed information to other things to make it useful in other ways. So... You know, power sensors, light sensors, automatic lights, automatic this, you know, all these sort of bits and pieces as Internet of Things. And that's really what that buzzword means is stuff that's not computers, as you rightly put before. And I thought, didn't say anything at the time, but I thought, hey, that's actually pretty good because it's pretty close to what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that was straight off the top of my head too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, okay, there's a few exceptions to that, right? You know, um, security cameras are kind of not really into the things. They kind of are, but they're kind of not. Mm. Um, you know, network equipment, I mean, they're network connected, but they're not computers. Well, they kind of are, but they're kind of not. Yeah. Um, but it's all those little end devices, usually connecting to your home Wi-Fi. Yes, exactly. All right. So um, let's uh, call it quits, I guess. Yeah, I think so. And we'll hopefully see you folks next time. Um, feel free to pass us any questions or, or feedback if we're wrong. We like to be told we're wrong occasionally. Feedback at techexplainers.com. Um, listen to us Tiger Access Radio Wednesdays every second Wednesday at 10am yeah thanks for see you next time cheers